Hi, my name is uh, Jürgen Höller. I have the pleasure and the privilege to serve as the Spring Framework Open Source Project Lead. Um, I've uh, already had the pleasure to do so for 15 years and counting. I initially co-founded the project with Rod Johnson uh, in early 2003, so um, uh, that's a uh, yeah, quite quite a while, but uh, I've always been in the in, in essentially in the same role. Uh, so the, the the core spring framework, the core framework in our portfolio, is very much uh, my um, my well professional life these days, right? Uh, the uh, I've had side responsibilities over the years, but uh, the the core responsibility for the open source project is uh, uh, was always on the top of my list. We initially um, uh, started Spring with a consulting background. So uh, um, all of the, the, the people initially involved uh, were consultants in Enterprise Java, uh, suffering through a lot of the pain. Um, this was early 2000s, right? So uh, 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 there was quite a bit of pain involved still. And uh, just looking for a better way to architect uh, at the application level, um, we, we were all familiar, of course, with the infrastructure of the time, also the, open, the, the, the early open source projects of the time, uh, Apache Struts, uh, the early days of Apache Tomcat, Hibernate. Um, so we, we, we were looking for an integrative approach towards building Java enterprise applications uh, with the, the tooling of the time and the infrastructure of the time. And, uh, um, I, I personally just loved the, the approach that Rod laid out in his first book, J2E Design and Development, and we, we, um, we found immediate agreement uh, that this is worth taking forward. The, 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 this early framework sketch that came with the book was, uh, you basically dump it out there, I mean, who's supposed to pick this up? My, my proposal was to, to turn it into a, proper, a properly managed open source project. Uh, and that's exactly what we did in February 2003 um, with uh, the early days of the Spring Framework project. Um, and the, we, we took it from there, uh, of course, for, for many years or in, in the meantime. Spring always had the ambition to provide a, a comprehensive and complete programming and configuration model of its own. Uh, this was very much the case from the early days onwards. It is even more so the case now. Um, this has many, it's a trade-off, right? It has many benefits. We are very agile in how we, we evolve the framework. Uh, we're not really constrained by, uh, by abstractions that are not of immediate relevance to us. Uh, but we, at the same time, we integrate with many of the common abstractions out there, the Servlet API, the JPA API, uh, even um, uh, Java E, the concurrency model, uh, the, the concurrency abstractions in Java E7. We, we have many integration points, uh, but the way we see them is that a, a, a spring-based application architecture uh, uh, runs on the, this chosen infrastructure underneath. Uh, the, the purpose of the, um, uh, the specifications, the APIs coming out of Java E, for us is largely integration with uh, other infrastructure that you choose to use. Um, of course, there's a perceived uh, a kind of competition that Java EE also has a, a sort of programming model, a, a, an application programming model uh, that, that comes with it. Um, but that's what we are an alternative to, right? The, the, the programming model. But uh, that's not unusual. From the early days onwards, there have always been uh, web frameworks, there have always been uh, persistence frameworks. And uh, even in, the, in, in these modern days, binding frameworks, of course, uh, JSON binding frameworks, uh, this is very much still the case today. And uh, Spring is in a, in, a, in a very special position in, in being able to integrate with uh, kind of standardized abstractions, as well as with the de facto standards coming out of the open source uh, community. And the, the, most, the most important part, I find, is to do it in a timely manner. So we are very keen on providing the best possible programming and configuration arrangement when it's actually needed. Um, and uh, I'm talking about delivery and de deployment, about production essentially here. Uh, it's not good enough it, if it's worded out in some PDF document. It's not even good enough if it's specced out in a, in a little API chart somewhere in Maven Central. We want this to be immediately consumable and usable in, in production-oriented development when we ship it. 
Uh, and this is our single biggest strength, uh, that we are, we are in a position to do this and that we're making good use of that position um, in, in every direction from, um, say, in recent times, uh, embracing Kotlin, uh, um, embracing reactive architectures, uh, uh, Project Reactor, reactive streams. Um, none of this came out of any form of standardization process. It, it, uh, but all, uh, both of them, Kotlin and reactive streams, came out of industry collaboration efforts of some sorts. We strongly be believe in collaboration with other stakeholders out there in the open source ecosystem in the, in the Java industry. Um, and we are, we are really picking up um, uh, all of those efforts as timely as possible. That's, uh, that's the way we deal it. That is kind of the strength of our offering. And, and uh, a, a programming and configuration model on top that brings all of those things together in a, uh, in a, a, a quite uniform and uh, uh, at the same time, diverse uh, ar arrangement uh, is, uh, is pretty much this unique kind of spring style that we um, pursue over all those years. In 2014, we started uh, an, an effort called Spring Boot. Uh, spring Boot is, wasn't our first attempt actually at a sort of uh, um, getting started model uh, where um, uh, lots of uh, lots of the, 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 the kinds of nuts and bolts of, an, uh, of, of, a, of a spring setup was, was prepared for you where you could basically start coding uh, with a given arrangement and don't worry about configuration too much. Uh, we've had our attempts at this before but a Spring Boot was really the one that the world was waiting for it seems. Uh, it really took off uh, uh, immediately um, after its launch. Uh, was Spring Framework 4 based so it was a, already a co-evolution between um, Spring Framework 4 and Spring Boot, a strong co-evolution. The way I, uh, I, I tend to see this is that they, we introduced many configuration variants, so uh, many, many dynamic configuration variants in Spring Framework 4. Uh, and Spring Boot kind of is, is, is using them on steroids. It's, it's really, it's, it, it, it's the reference architecture for what you can do uh, with Spring's un Spring Framework's underlying configuration model in, in these modern times. And uh, it turns out to be extremely popular, um, not only for uh, like smaller scale microservice oriented architectures, but almost for any kind of enterpri uh, enterprise application project, and in particular if it's newly started. Um, so in the, the way, the way uh, I see it these days is that there are essentially two kinds of, uh, um, of, of Spring users out there. The ones with really long-lived, uh, uh, carefully crafted system architectures um, and, 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 and the ones with uh, more smaller scale, more service-oriented, uh, smaller scale uh, projects, independently uh, evolved projects, and they tend to choose Spring Boot, whereas the former tends to have a custom Spring framework-based architecture. Um, and that is that is a perfectly uh, great arrangement for us because uh, it's a really uh, large audience out there for uh, uh, both more, it, well, you could argue it's a traditional way of using Spring. I would argue it's a custom way. It's, it's a custom application architecture built on Spring. This can be a very modern, even with functional registration, even with reactive architectures, there are still plenty of reasons why you would want to build a custom stack and integrate it with your existing infrastructure. But if your requirements are pretty straightforward, if you just want to get started with um, standard default conventions, then Spring Boot is your friend, of course, uh, both on, at the auto configuration front and in particular also with its runtime features these days. Um, the, the, the monitoring features that come out of the box, you don't need to handcraft uh, the arrangement. You can, if you're happy with uh, uh, Boot's default model, just take it as it is and integrate with it. That's, um, Boot has so many, there are so many reasons to, uh, to consider using Spring Boot these days, even more so in 2018 than, than back in 2014, I would argue. And uh, we just recently, uh, well, just a half year ago, we launched Spring Boot 2.0, the Spring Boot 2.1 in the meantime. So Spring Boot evolves very quickly as well. It's, uh, it's by far the uh, most actively evolving project in the portfolio, I would argue. Looking into the future from where we are now, um, I, I personally, I usually, I, I want to have a plan for the next, say, at least 12 months, ideally like 18 months or so. 
anything beyond that is actually a bit of a challenge in, in this industry because uh, it's just moving, moving forward so quickly. There's so many things happening. Uh, but we're always looking for inspiration. And there's plenty of inspiration at the moment. I mean, of course, uh, like Kotlin, uh, functional API style in, in Java 8, the, the reactive architectures, those were the inspirations of the past few years. Um, right now, we are looking at uh, um, a few other, a few new efforts uh, like R sockets in the reactive space, R2DBC, reactive uh, data store access abstraction. Uh, there's a uh, so reactive messaging architectures, reactive data store abstractions in the reactive front. There's plenty of stuff happening with other collaborators. Uh, again, going back into uh, industry collaboration, there are other stakeholders out there who really want to use this. And there are other like middleware providers out there who really want a, a, an, a, an, a sort of abstracted model uh, that they can support. And uh, so that's on the reactive front. Um, Quite immediately, I, I would hope that many of those things will come together next year, uh, Spring Fabric 5 to 2 timeframe in 2019. They certainly have the potential to. There's Kotlin 1.3, there's Kotlin coroutines on the Kotlin front. Um, uh, while you may choose to use those features with uh, the current Spring Stack already, we have ideas of how we could specifically support coroutines and how, how we could integrate community efforts out there back into the core framework for a, an even more first class Kotlin story. Um, and then there's JDK 11, of course. Uh, there's the ongoing evolution towards JDK 12 and higher, which we are very ambitious uh, about. So um, we certainly want to empower every Spring user out there to be able to use the latest and greatest coming out of Open JDK uh, whenever it's released. Right? We we focus on the long-term support releases, but at the same time we give a best effort love to the uh, to the releases in between, and in particular to the latest like 12, 13 in, 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 in next year, in 2019. Uh, so the, the, that's, uh, that's quite a bit of inspiration that comes our way, um, where we're just trying to find the, our way of integrating them into our programming and configuration model. Um, uh, the way it looks right now, uh, there's plenty to do, uh, but uh, everything we have in mind uh, seems like we can roll this into the Spring 5 architecture of the framework. So uh, there are no immediate plans for like a major revision of Spring Framework 6 at this very point. Um, we are going to continue our tradition of uh, very rich feature releases like we had with Spring Framework 4.1, 4.2, in the previous generation and now uh, we've already have Spring Framework 5.1 so uh, there's going to be a very nice 5 to 2 uh, next year for sure. Um, chances are there might be a f maybe a 5 to 3, 5 to 4, 5 to 5 even. We haven't decided yet. Um, but we're certainly going to ship at least one feature release of that kind every year. So our typical iteration is 10 months. And that seems to be a good fit with where the industry is going. We get a new JDK release every six months now. So uh, uh, we are not even the most ambitious out there in terms of the release cycle. Um, but yeah, there's, uh, there's, there's plenty of topics where there is already interest in adopting them. We're always out there looking for uh, early adopters and uh, hearing about early adopter stories and experiences and uh, learning already initial lessons from them. That's uh, the greatest starting point for anything we do.